Season four of Stranger Things was arguably the highlight of summer 2022. Even if you didn't watch the show, it was almost impossible to escape the fan frenzy that surrounded it. From movies like The Goonies and E.T. to horror classics like Nightmare on Elm Street, sci-fi and fantasy films such as The NeverEnding Story, The Hair, Politics, Fashion, Dungeons and Dragons, Music. Stranger Things is a TV experience that draws inspiration from all corners of 1980s pop culture. But underneath the nostalgia lies possibly the biggest influence of all, a strange series of supposedly non-fiction books released in the early 1990s, written by Peter Moon and Preston B. Nichols, the latter of whom claimed to have worked on a top secret military project based in Montauk, Long Island. According to them, not only had this undisclosed project figured out how to control the human mind, it had also opened up a time portal that stretched all the way from 1943 to 1983, and in doing so, had released a terrifying monster into the world. This is the story of the Montauk project. But before we get into it, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, glassesusa.com. Now I don't wear prescription glasses, but I am obsessed with sunglasses. I own far too many of them. And I know what you're thinking, aren't they just for summer? And my answer is absolutely not. Sunglasses are for every season. However, I do find it difficult to find glasses that suit me. I'm a very fussy person. And glassesusa.com is great because not only is there a huge variety of choices, but they also have a quiz that will pick out the perfect pair of glasses for you based on your face shape, which is great news for me because this quiz takes all of the hard work out of making a decision. They also have a virtual try on tool so you can see in real time just how good those glasses look on you. I used it to pick out my perfect pair of sunglasses. I chose the Atoto Hex in gold blue. These ones are my absolute favourites. I'm going to be wearing them for the rest of my life. I also got the Muse City Clear in grey green and the Muse Amity in shiny black. Both of these are your classic pair of black sunglasses that will go with absolutely anything. GlassesUSA.com also offers free shipping and returns and a 100% money back guarantee within 14 days so you can shop confidently. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers over 10 thousand prescription glasses and sunglasses including in-house brands like Muse and Amelia E and designer brands like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Gucci and many many more and sometimes they're up to 70% off retail prices and if you're watching this as a contact lens wearer then fret not because at glassesusa.com you can also get 25% off all contact lens brands including Vista Plus, AccuV and many more. You can follow the link in my description to grab your own glasses and I highly recommend you do because these they are stunning so thank you to glassesusa.com for kindly sponsoring today's video and without further ado let's get into the murky world of interdimensional time travel the occult and Jesus's assassination yes that is a thing in this story hold on to your egos because it's gonna be a wild ride <laughs> Our story begins with a man named Preston B. Nichols. He claimed to be an engineer with a degree in parapsychology and he also claimed, with zero proof obviously, to have had a long and illustrious career in the music industry, working with Mick Jagger, Phil Spector, Chubby Checker and the Moosey Blues to name but a few. The reality of Preston's life is a little more bleak. In an article written by Richard Metzger who met with Preston as part of a TV documentary, he describes a man that lives with his father in a rundown house that contained at least 500 cans of spam, some partially eaten with spoons still stuck in them, junk everywhere, a piss covered bathroom and a memorial shrine to Yul Brynner. What is a house without a memorial shrine to Yul Brynner? Mine is just off camera. He describes Preston in a very unflattering way, claiming that he was constantly passing gas and wearing clothes covered in dried food and spam gravy. You could well argue that we have no idea what Preston's life was was like before he burst onto the scene with the story of the Montauk project and that maybe the story I'm about to tell you has had some profound and rather depressing effect on him. But you do have to admit, it's a bit of a fall from grace. And as we'll get into later on, Preston might have had a sinister and disturbing ulterior motive for the grandiose claims that he would go on to make. By his own admission, he says, Things were not going well for me financially. 
when I met Peter Moon and we began writing the Montauk books. Peter, real name Vince Barbaric, is an ex-Scientologist and auditor who claims to have been in the Sea Organisation for 11 years and served in L. Ron Hubbard's personal office. When Peter first met Preston in November 1990, Preston had already unlocked repressed memories of his own involvement in a decade-spanning top-secret project. But how did he manage to unlock them? We'll begin with Preston's journey of recovering these memories and remember the story I'm about to tell you comes directly from him and we'll later learn that maybe he's not a very reliable source. In 1971 Preston Nichols claims to have begun working for a defence contractor on Long Island called Airborne Instruments Laboratory. While he claims to have had little interest in psychic phenomena he also tells us that he had gotten a grant to research whether or not mental telepathy existed which is a big undertaking for a man supposedly not interested interested in the field. Through his research with psychics, he claims to have discovered what he called a telepathic wave that could control the psychic's thoughts. It operated between 410 and 420 megahertz. And he says that he eventually traced this wave to an abandoned military base known as Camp Hero and the banana peel looking sage radar system that still remains there to this day. Camp Hero is located in Montauk Point State Park, which lies at the eastern tip of Long Island. It was commissioned in 1942 amid fears of a potential sea invasion of New York, and it was designed to look like a regular civilian neighbourhood to any enemies. It officially closed on January 31st, 1981, and soon became abandoned eventually being passed over to the state of New York for preservation. Despite officially being part of the Montauk Point State Park, parts of Camp Hero remain off limits to the general public to this day. Back when Preston first claims to have discovered this telepathic wave in the 70s, Camp Hero was still semi-operational, so it was damn near impossible for Preston to investigate. But Flash forward to 1984, and with the base now abandoned, Preston jumped at the chance to finally investigate. On his first visit, he claims to have found a bunch of high voltage equipment that's seemingly been left to collect dust, and he wants to take it home with him, but Preston is no faith. Through trying to track down the owners of the equipment, Preston is connected with a man that works for a military overseas terminal in New Jersey, who basically tells him, take what you want, bestie, Camp Hero is your oyster. So, off Preston goes to Camp Hero, accompanied by a psychic friend of his named Brian, because no trip is complete without your psychic friend tagging along. While he's there, he meets a man who claims to have been living in the building since the base was abandoned and he actually recognises Preston but Preston's like who the bloody hell are you mate I've never seen you before in my life this lack of recognition doesn't deter the man who starts weaving a bizarre tale of a top secret project that was taking place at Camp Hero and how there had been a massive explosion everyone had lost their minds and a huge monster had appeared and scared the crap out of everyone he claimed that Preston was his boss on this top secret project Imagine that. Preston eventually leaves the man and goes to find his mate Brian, who's freaking out, saying that the base has extremely bad vibes and he's just not comfortable at all. But instead of leaving, he decides to do a psychic reading, which throws up a ton of terrible images. He sees people engaging in mind control, changing weather patterns, animals crashing through windows, and lo and behold, a beast appearing. They end up leaving the Montauk base with as much equipment as their greedy hands can carry. But this was just the first of a series of alleged encounters which helped Preston realise his own involvement in the Montauk project. At the time, Preston was running what he called Space Time Laboratories out of a building in the backyard of his home. Now, I'm the first to admit that I'm not very technically minded, so seeing Preston's wall of radio monitors makes me think, yeah, he's definitely got some kind of technical knowledge but that doesn't mean that the wild story that he's spinning is true. It's important to note here that people with technical knowledge have asked him to elaborate on his stories and he never did. When I practically begged him to put out some detailed technical information on the Montauk and Philadelphia projects, he felt that the audience would be too small to make it worth his while. In other words, Nichols wants to write mystical UFO conspiracy fodder 
because he knows it will sell on the mystical UFO conspiracy community. Preston's little world has been decidedly rocked by his foray out to Montauk and he just can't get enough. He goes back to interview locals who tell him strange stories of snow in August and other weather anomalies, as well as animals descending on the town in packs and crashing through store windows, much like the scene that Preston's psychic friend Brian had envisioned back at the base. He also claims to have met with the chief of police, who tells him that crimes would weirdly happen in two-hour windows and that groups of teenagers would get together en masse within the same time period and then separate almost as if they were being controlled by forces outside of themselves. In November 1984, a man named Duncan Cameron arrived at Space Time Laboratories. He wanted Preston to help him with a piece of audio equipment, but quickly became enamoured with the psychics that Preston was working with in the lab. At least, that's the story that Preston tells us, and I find it almost hard to believe. See, Preston was involved in UFO, New Age and conspiracy circles in the early 1980s, and it's much more likely that he may met Duncan at one of these psychotronic events and together they decided to concoct the wild story of Montauk. But with no real evidence to prove that, I guess that's just my own conspiracy theory. Preston decides to take Duncan to Montauk and things get strange. Duncan recognises almost everything. He's got an intimate knowledge of the layout of the base and when they entered what Preston calls the transmitter room, Duncan went into a trance-like state. Now, one of the huge issues that Preston was having around these revelations was that he couldn't remember how he was involved. Sure, people had told him that he'd been somewhat high up in this Montauk project, but he had no recollection of it. Duncan was having a similar issue himself. He claimed to have an intimate knowledge of the base, but the details of what happened there were sketchy. There had to be a way to unlock these hidden memories. So Preston began experimenting with Duncan and says, I had applied techniques that I'd learned to help Duncan unblock his memories. Layers of programming were now coming out of Duncan. A lot of information concerned the Montauk project. We'll go into more explicit detail about how exactly Preston managed to unblock Duncan's memories in a little while. And the techniques are important because they might just be the key to understanding some of the motives behind this story. For now, though, all you need to know is that these so-called deprogramming techniques revealed that Duncan had been programmed to befriend Preston, murder him, and blow up his lab. What a shocker. As you can imagine, this revelation was deeply upsetting for Duncan. He had a bit of a soft spot for Preston, so much so that he denounced any and all programming and essentially swore his allegiance to Preston instead. And it's through helping Duncan uncover these hidden memories that Preston managed to uncover his own. He began to discover that he had been living in two separate realities and he remembers some strange things that had been happening to him. For instance, he remembered finding band-aids on his hands that hadn't been there before and he said that he would often appear with injuries that he couldn't remember getting. He also claims that for a while he was getting really tired and obviously if you're living two lives, that's going to be exhausting. I live one and I'm tired all the bloody time. As the haze of missing time begins to clear, he becomes even more determined to uncover this second reality in which he claims to have been living. According to him, he entered a high security area at AIL that he didn't have clearance for. But instead of being ushered away by the guards, they gave him a badge with his name on and let him in. He claimed to have followed the churning of his gut to a swanky office that had a nameplate on the desk. It read, Preston B. Nichols, Assistant Project Director. You've really got to give it up to Preston's finely attuned stomach for leading him to exactly the right place. Through digging around in this office, he uncovered an entire second career working at AIL, which he can't talk about because he's conveniently signed a 30-year non-disclosure agreement. He eventually leaves, but when he tries to go back in a second time, he's denied access and referred to the project director, who basically tells him, you ain't got an office 
this here, mate. What the hell are you talking about? Preston's explanation for this is that he's a programmed individual. So when he's taking part in his second life, it's under deep programming so that he won't remember it. He'd managed to enter this high security area as his ordinary self somehow, instead of his programmed self. But security wasn't going to let that happen a second time. In June of 1990, at Space Time Laboratories, aka his garden shed, Preston was busy working on creating what he called a Delta T antenna. He claimed that it could shift time zones and quite literally bend time. And he said, Apparently, as I sat there and held the wires together to solder them, the time functions were causing my mind to shift. The more soldering I did, the more I became aware. And then one day, bang, the whole memory line blew open for me. The antenna was stressing time, bending it. And enough bend was created so that I was subconsciously in two timelines. This was my memory breakthrough. So that's it. He created this antenna and then boom, memory unlocked. And he claimed that because he was no longer a programmed individual, he was laid off from AIL in July of 1990. He just so happened to meet Peter Moon a few months later a man that would soon become his scribe. But Preston had been talking publicly about Montauk and the like throughout the 1980s. According to the website de173.com, in 1988, a video surfaced titled The Montauk Survivors, and it starred three men in a living room in Long Island, Preston B. Nichols, Duncan Cameron, and a man named Al Bielig, who we'll come on to. In this video, they tell the story of the Montauk Project and its connections with another fabled government project called the Philadelphia Experiment. But if Preston's memories weren't fully unlocked until 1990, then how come he was talking so clearly about these supposed experiences in 1988? It might just be an error with the dates, but if it's not, well... It plays a pretty big hole in the story. But for now, let's suspend disbelief and dive into the murky details of what he uncovered. The Montauk Project has its origins in another supposedly top secret government project that you might have heard of. It was called the Philadelphia Experiment. And this is a very brief description of the original story. In 1955, Morris K. Jessup wrote a book titled The Case for the UFO. And the only way to describe this book is that it walked so that Eric von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods could run. It covered all manner of strange events from objects falling from the sky at random, levitation, our favourite lost continents of Lemuria and Atlantis, and a large section on the disappearances of ships. Morris took his book out on the lecturing circuit. He believed that more research should be done around the study of gravity, and he wanted the government to fund research into Einstein's unified field theory. This caught the attention of a lad named Carl Allen, a man described as an outcast who never worked very hard at anything except for leg pulling. He decided to send a copy of Jessup's book to the Office of Naval Research research in late 1955, but this was no ordinary copy. Inside, it had been heavily annotated by what looked to be three people. They were having a conversation about the origins of UFOs and the secrets of propulsion in the margins. Alongside sending the book, Carl Allen began writing letters to Jessup himself, using the name Carlos Miguel Allende. Carl had a very unique way of writing letters. The capitalization was frantic and it almost read like a stream of consciousness. He wrote in a very bloody convoluted way that the Navy had actually figured out Einstein's unified field theory and they had used it to experiment on a ship called the USS Eldridge, eventually teleporting it from the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard all the way to Norfolk, Virginia. What a trip that must have been. I don't know about you, I would love to teleport. It would make life so much easier. But according to Carl Allen, the crew on the ship got all messed up. Some of them even ended up being fused to the ship itself. They're like half man, half ship. Can you imagine? Maybe teleportation isn't such a good idea. The Office of Naval Research met with Jessup where he was shown the annotated copy of his book. When he looked at it, he was like, I know that bloody handwriting. 
that's that bloody lad that's been sending me funny letters. I don't know why I've gone West Country. Christ almighty. The annotated copy ended up getting reprinted by a military contractor called the Varro Manufacturing Company. These copies became known as the Varro Edition and they became hot collector's items for those interested in the strange world of UFOs. Just a few short years later, Jessup committed suicide, although some believe that he didn't take his own life and that he was murdered to stop him from revealing the truth. But, according to Jacques Vallée, The Allende revelations became an obsession for Jessup. In connection with a car accident and marital difficulties, the murky disclosure that the Office of Naval Research seemed to take so seriously drove the disturbed researcher into an even deeper emotional turmoil. It wasn't until 20 years later that it was revealed that Carl Allen had fabricated all of the notes in the so-called Varro edition. It was really just one bloke with a larger-than-life story and a wild imagination. Despite this revelation, and the Navy veterans that worked on the USS Eldridge saying that none of this ever happened, people still believe that the Philadelphia experiment was real. There is some argument to be made that this story could have been based on what was called degaussing operations that were designed to make ships invisible to undersea mines and torpedoes. And whether it's true or not, it's a fascinating story that has stood the test of time. Since Jessup's death at the end of the 1950s, multiple books have been published on the Philadelphia experiment, each of them expanding on the original story. One of the most popular was written in 1979 by William L. Moore and Charles Belitz, where they interviewed a man that they called Dr. Reinhardt, and he claimed that the Philadelphia experiment was undertaken under the code name Project Rainbow. The interesting thing about the Philadelphia experiment story is that it's relatively easy to create your own version of what happened, find a bunch of people that conveniently only want to be referred to by false names, publish a book and add to the ever expanding and increasingly hard to follow law of an unverifiable story. Which brings us conveniently to Al Bielik. Al liked to claim that he had no real interest in this subject until 1988 when he sat down to watch the fictional movie The Philadelphia Experiment. However, his own admissions and affiliations proved that to be untrue. In the 1960s, he was friends with a man named Ivan T. Sanderson, who is known for coining the term cryptozoology. And according to Al, he was very interested in the Philadelphia experiment and claims that some of his final material wound up in William Moore's hands. How would he know that if he wasn't interested in the story at all until 1988? There are many examples of Al being present in New Age, ufology and conspiracy circles throughout the 80s, much like Preston B. Nichols and Duncan Cameron. In fact, that's how the three of them met in 1985 at a psychotronics event in Dayton, Ohio. It's always these psychotronic events. Al says, I asked Duncan, I said, do you have the feeling that possibly you know me from somewhere? He said, yes. I said, do you have any idea from where? He says, no. I said, well, I have the same feeling about you, but I don't have any more idea than you do where from. And before we left that conference... I figured out I probably knew him from a past life. But it wasn't until watching the 1984 film, The Philadelphia Experiment, that Al finally discovered how he knew Duncan. The film was directed by Stuart Raphael, who also directed such gems as Mannequin 2 on the Move and Tammy and the T-Rex, two absolute bangers if I do say so myself. The film added time travel to the existing story of The Philadelphia Experiment, and the protagonists were two sailors, David and Jim, who jump off the USS Eldridge in 1943 and travel all the way to 1984. Jim ends up disappearing in a beam of light and is sent back to his original timeline, but David is stuck in the 80s. The scientist who was in charge of the original experiment in 1943 is now attempting a similar one in 1984, but things go dramatically wrong when they accidentally open up a vortex that causes strange weather anomalies and eventually 
threatens to consume the entire world. In the middle of this vortex, they find the USS Eldridge and they discover that these two experiments, one in 1943 and one in 1984, have become connected. And the only way to stop this vortex from destroying the world in 1984 is to destroy the generators on board the USS Eldridge in 1943 because they're powering the whole operation. Are you following? I know it's a little bit all over the place. It's like a weird time space mashup. It doesn't make a whole bunch of sense, but it's a fun movie. And it had a very profound impact on Al, who basically said, Wait, is this fucking play about us? Through watching the film, Al started his journey to recovering his own repressed memories. And while the film triggered a lot of them, as far as I know, Preston also helped to deprogram him too. Al's entire world was turned upside down when he discovered that his real name wasn't even Al. It was Edward Cameron. His intuition when he first met Duncan in 1985 was right because they were both the sons of an ex-Navy man named Alexander Duncan Cameron. Duncan was his brother. And not only that, they were both sailors on board the USS Eldridge in 1943. I'm sure at this point you're probably wondering how all of this is connected to Montauk in the 1980s. Well, According to Al, on August 12th, 1943, the original Philadelphia experiment was being run and the USS Eldridge was rendered invisible. We saw crewmen all around us going crazy, so we jumped off the ship. But instead of landing in the water of the Philadelphia Harbor, we landed on the grass at the Montauk Army Base at Long Island, New York. Dr. Von Neumann was waiting for us. It is said that he died in 1957. No way! He was there in Montauk in 83, we had somehow been sucked into hyperspace and been pulled into the future. Now don't worry, I know what you're going to ask me. Who the hell is Dr. Von Neumann? Well, through recovering his memories, Al began to claim that the man that was interviewed for William Moore's book, Dr. Reinhardt, was actually Dr. John von Neumann, the famed mathematician and physicist who supposedly died in 1957, but for this story is conveniently still alive. Al claimed that he was the real head of the Rainbow Project and he would later appear at Montauk too. If you're thinking that Al's recovered memories sound similar to the plot of the 1984 movie, then you'd be correct, it's almost identical. In fact, if you really want to point the finger at one thing for creating this entire bonkers story, then that movie is the best place to point it. I mean, I understand taking creative license, but if I was a creator of that movie, it'd be friggin' lawsuit time. But as we'll get into, the very fact that the movie was made is apparently proof of the conspiracy itself. So to recap, because I know this story can be hard to follow, Preston and Duncan have uncovered memories of living double lives and being involved in a top secret project at Montauk. And Al Bielik has recovered living a life identical to the plot of a movie. But how did the Philadelphia experiment evolve into whatever was going on out at Montauk in the 1980s? To answer that, that, we need to delve deeper into the madness. According to Preston, alongside the Rainbow Project, which was the code name for the Philadelphia experiment, another top secret government project was being conducted, this time into weather manipulation, using the technology and research of none other than Wilhelm Reich. Preston claims it was called the Phoenix Project. Reich was a psychoanalyst who worked closely with Sigmund Freud. He had a long and successful career before he became an enemy of the FDA when he claimed to have discovered something called orgone energy. You can think of this as a kind of life force of the universe, similar to the concept of animal magnetism. Reich claimed that there were two types of orgone, good and deadly. Particularly violent storms held deadly orgone energy, which led him to create what he called the cloud buster, a device that was designed to manipulate the orgone energy in the atmosphere to disperse particularly violent storms. Kate Bush wrote a song about it called Cloud Buster. And apparently Devo's energy dome hats were supposedly used to recycle orgone energy. 
But in Preston's world, Reich was actively collaborating with the US government to manipulate the weather and to help create radio sondes. In the real world, a radio sonde measures things like pressure, temperature and humidity and they're sent into the atmosphere by a weather balloon. However, Preston claimed that radio sondes are nothing but weather manipulation technology based completely on Reich's work. He claimed that they were sent into the atmosphere to either disperse or transmit deadly orgone energy and it gets worse. See Reich claimed that healthy happy people were filled with positive orgone energy whereas sad and depressed people had higher levels of deadly orgone energy. If the US government could manipulate the levels of orgone in the atmosphere, then this could affect people too. You could quite literally change people's moods. But that's if you believe in all of this. Preston claimed that in the 1950s, It was decided that the remnants of Project Rainbow and the Radioson project should be included under the same umbrella with the Human Factor study. After that point, the title of Phoenix Project was used to refer to all of these activities. So they're bringing together research on teleportation and also the potential to manipulate both weather and humans. It's a very big project. Preston claimed that Brookhaven Labs in Long Island were the headquarters for the project and that Dr. John von Neumann was at the helm, despite the fact that he died halfway through the 1950s, but we'll just brush over that. Alongside him were a team of Nazi scientists that had been brought to the US during Operation Paperclip. Now, Operation Paperclip was a real programme that brought former Nazi scientists and engineers to the USA after World War II. Alongside that, some of them were absorbed into positions of power in West Germany, as well as in NATO, despite many of them being wanted for some of the most heinous war crimes imaginable. So Preston's story of Nazi scientists in the USA is grounded in reality, but that doesn't make his story true. When you ask for evidence to back up the claims, including some evidence that shows that von Neumann was still alive, you'll get none. And Preston will tell you that you need to learn the difference between soft facts and hard facts. Soft facts are not untrue, they're just not backed up by irrefutable documentation. A hard fact would be documentation or hard physical evidence that could stand up to scrutiny. A perfect example of a soft fact would be Preston's claim that through his research on the Phoenix Project, Dr. von Neumann discovered that humans are born with a time reference point. At conception, an energy being is attached to a timeline, and we all start from that point. To understand this, it is necessary to view the energy being, or soul, as distinct from the physical body of the person concerned. Our whole reference as a physical and metaphysical being streams from that time reference, which actually resides within the electromagnetic background of our planet. This time reference is the basic orientation point you have to the universe and the way it operates. Remember, the original Philadelphia experiment left crew members with catastrophic injuries and Preston says that this was because crew members had been severed from their time reference point. The Phoenix Project wanted to find a way to rerun these experiments, only this time they didn't want to create no half-men, half-ship creatures. Through von Neumann's research, a computer was used used to create an electromagnetic background that locked the crew's physical body in place, as well as recreating their time reference points. The main takeaway from this initial phase of the project was that human beings were directly influenced by electromagnetics, and according to Preston, The group at Brookhaven already had Reichian and stealth technologies, which could definitely affect the mind of man. All right, what we're seeing here actually is in actuality the genesis of the Montauk Project. The Montauk Project was Phoenix II. The Montauk Project is a combination of Wilhelm Reich's work and the Philadelphia Experiment. It was like two separate little projects going on in Phoenix I. Towards the end of the Phoenix Project, by using some of Wilhelm Reich's concepts and some of the modulation schemes gleaned from the Radio Song Project, Coupling that to the equipment that was used on the boat in the later invisibility project, they found out to couple the two, you now could use this 
for mind control. He claims that the original Phoenix project ended in 1967, with the US Congress being told that it would be possible to quite literally change a way that a human being thinks. Congress were terrified of this bombshell of mind control falling into the wrong hands. And so, in 1969, they decided to shut down the Phoenix project. But these scientists had spent years developing these techniques and they weren't ready to give it all up. And soon after they were supposedly ordered to shut down the project, they found the perfect home for what would later become known as the Montauk Project. Instead of following the orders of Congress, the team at Brookhaven decided to approach the military to share what they'd been working on. And obviously the military were chomping at the bit to get their hands on any technology that could manipulate a human being's mind. As such, they were ready to give the team at Brookhaven what Ever they needed, including cash. But the project was already flush, and according to Preston, the entire operation was being funded via Nazi gold obtained from an armoured train in the final days of World War II. Of course it was. No, what they needed was, in Preston's words, a huge radio sound that would operate around 425 to 450 megahertz. From earlier research, it was known that this was one of the window frequencies for getting into the human consciousness. Remember, this is the so-called telepathic wave that Preston had tracked down to the SAGE radar at Montauk back when he first became aware of it in the early 1970s, before he uncovered his memories and all that stuff. According to him, in the early 1970s, Brookhaven was given access to the radar system, and they soon began to discover that they could change the mood of everyone on the base just by changing the frequency and the pulse of the radar, just tinkering around with it. And so began what Preston affectionately calls the microwave oven experiments. And they were hitting these poor bastards with uh, the microwave beam out of the sage transmitter direct. Although multiple test subjects were used in these experiments, it was most often Duncan Cameron, who had been recruited for the project because of his strong psychic abilities. He would be placed in a chair in a shielded room and the SAGE radar system would be focused on the room. The technicians would try different settings, tinker about, you know, change the frequencies, and they'd record the results to see what would happen to the test subject. Preston says that they would try to manipulate Duncan's emotions through these experiments, and that they were later found to have been extremely damaging. Previous research in or about 1986 indicated that Duncan was actually brain dead. We learned that the only reason Duncan is alive today is due to his strong psychic aptitude. Now, I haven't been privy to Duncan Cameron's x-rays that show that he's brain dead. And if he really was subjected to these kind of experiments, then I'm not bloody surprised. Poor guy was having frequencies beamed at him left, right and centre. His insides were probably burnt to a crisp. However... You cannot walk and talk if you're brain dead. It is literally not possible. So if you believe that Preston and the gang are telling the truth, then you also believe that it's possible for brain dead people to walk, talk and be completely cognizant via their psychic abilities. And if you do believe that, then please do drop me an email because I've got this amazing bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. It's phenomenal. And you'll get it for a rock bottom price. The technicians at Montauk weren't happy with just changing people's moods. They wanted to delve deeper into the world of mind control. And that's when they began to build what is now known as the Montauk chair. Preston claims that the technicians had access to a mind reading machine that had been built in the early 1950s using alien technology from the Sirius star system, which is a great get out whenever some Someone asks you to get into the technical details just go sorry I don't know it's from the aliens mate don't ask me this machine could supposedly read the aura of a human being and would translate it into something that people could read using a Cray-1 supercomputer so if the machine could read a mind, surely if they just tweaked it about a little bit, they could do a whole lot more with it. To cut a long, convoluted and scientifically sketchy story short, this mind reading machine was hooked up to a bunch of electrical coils, some pyramid technology and the radar system itself. And they eventually managed to turn the Montauk chair into a transmitter. Preston claims that this is when Al Bielik took on a key role in the project, saying... Originally, he was 
was brought to the project to explain what was going on metaphysically with the use of the transmitter on human beings. So not only were Duncan Cameron and Al Bielik involved in the 1940s experiments on the USS Eldridge, the two supposed brothers are now back at it again in the 1970s at Montauk, along with Preston, who's working there as a technician. And Duncan and Al have no idea at this point that they're brothers. And Preston's basically being brainwashed every night so that he don't remember any of this he doesn't know that he's part of this secret project are you following because there's going to be a quiz at the end and you better get the answers right once the transmitter was up and running they would make a test subject which was usually duncan cameron concentrate on an object in his mind and then he could literally make that object appear at the Montauk base via this transmitter. Apparently it got so intense that Duncan could literally think of entire buildings and make them appear. So like he's just sat there thinking like all right go on then Empire State Building. Here we go lads and then suddenly it's there suddenly it's just appeared and I'm going to assume that he only ever manifested like small buildings because as far as I know nobody looked out of their window at Montauk and went bloody hell love come over have you seen that fucking Empire State Building over there by the late 1970s Duncan was a dab hand at operating the chair and the technicians at Montauk had begun to discover the weird and wonderful world of remote viewing this like mind control was an actual area that the US government was actively exploring between 1978 and 1987 remote viewing is the supposed ability to be able to see events people places from a distance using the power of your mind when you start looking at remote viewing, you're looking at producing information that violates space-time, then your reality starts coming unglued. And the Stargate project was a research program that was funded by the US government to figure out whether this was something that could be used by the military. John Ronson's book, The Men Who Stare at Goats, is all about it. And I'd also highly recommend watching the subsequent documentary that he made about it. All of that is to say that parts of the Montauk Project story are very much grounded in reality. And that's what makes stories like this so appealing. According to Press the technicians at Montauk took this technology further, eventually culminating in Duncan being able to push his mind so far into another person's that he could actually control them. This was great news for the team at Montauk, who could now load information and commands into an individual's mind. And Preston claims that this is where a lot of those rumours of strange activity in Montauk came from. To get Duncan to participate in these mind control techniques, he had to be put into an altered state of consciousness. And to do this, he was put into an orgasmic trance. His conscious mind would be diverted through sexual bliss. What could be termed as the primitive mind would then surface. His primitive mind, at the disposal of the researchers, became very suggestible and therefore controllable. Preston also claimed that by 1978, the team at Montauk, which don't forget includes both him and Al Bielik, had fully developed these mind control techniques and they had videotaped them to distribute amongst various government agencies. But conveniently, those tapes have never surfaced. As the experiments continued, the team began to notice that Duncan's abilities actually allowed him to bend time. And this piqued the interest of the technicians who saw the potential for not only mind control but time travel too. They made further tweaks to the Montauk chair, eventually employing what Preston claimed were the same techniques that were used on the USS Eldridge in 1943. By emulating that technology, the project was now trying to open a time door to the USS Eldridge itself, much like the plot of the 1984 movie. But don't go thinking that this is all just plagiarism. They added in a few new details of their own. These experiments in time travel culminate in Duncan being directed to concentrate on an opening in time and according to Preston at this point a hole or time portal would appear you could walk through the portal from 1980 to 1990 there was an opening you could look into it looked like a circular corridor with a light at the other end I've been told by those who entered the tunnel that it looked like a spiral similar to science fiction style renditions of a vortex 
Sadly, Preston never got to experience the vortex himself because he was considered too valuable to the project. And, as with all of these top secret experiments in time travel, it had some teething issues. There was the very real possibility of getting lost in space or having the portal drift away. Poor old Duncan was put through the ringer again and was extensively trained to keep the portal stable. They finally managed to keep it stable by focusing on what Preston calls the natural 20-year biorhythms of the Earth. He says, The vortex ran between August 12, 1943 and August 12, 1983 because that was the master vortex. That gave them the stability to create what we call an open-ended vortex. It's called open-ended because there is no device at the other end which is anchoring it. Is this all making sense? If not, I really don't blame you for being confused. I've spent months researching this story and it still absolutely baffles me. Anyway, they've got it all figured out. The vortex is well and truly stable and now they need to start slimming down this project. It's bloated and out of control. There's so many blokes that could start yapping on about time travel. They ended up getting rid of most of the military and Preston stayed on as the technical director of the project as well as Al Bielik, and the entire operation had become finely attuned to Duncan Cameron. But things were about to get a whole lot more disturbing. We destroy the government. We're destroying time. No more problems on the way. Once the team at Montauk had gotten rid of a lot of the original technicians, they brought in a secret crew, and this ushered in a new phase of the Montauk project. The objective of this new phase was to explore the very nature of time itself, and this was where the project began to get even more sinister. Preston initially claims that the project technicians would grab winos and derelicts from the street, his words, not mine, and they would send them through time. Those that made it back would report on what they had seen but Preston says that many of them were actually lost in time. Can you even imagine that? One minute you're living a relatively normal life until you're snatched up by a bunch of men in black, shoved into the future or the past or wherever and then you're just stuck there forever. Wild be pissed off. Preston claims that the project got so sophisticated that they were eventually able to wire up these unwilling participants with TV and radio equipment before they just threw them down the time tunnels, enabling them to report back live. I can imagine the scene now, the Montauk technicians all gathered around a table watching some unwilling participant tumble through time. Preston says that there's actually a bunch of videotapes of all of these wild experiences, but as of filming this, none have surfaced. You weren't really expecting me to splice in some actual time travel footage here, were you? I bloody wish. What scoop that would be? This story of targeting people who were less likely to be missed also links Montauk with other actual projects, such as MKUltra. We know that the CIA tested on unwitting subjects and that they targeted people who couldn't fight back. A common misconception that people have around MKUltra is that it was just one government project, but it was actually 162 individual projects that were farmed out to universities and other institutions, some of which had no idea that the project was actually being financed by the CIA. Early on, Alan Dulles pretty much decided that the CIA really has to be authorised to do whatever it takes, you know, in any field. He gives a talk in, in, in early 53 where he says, mind warfare is the great battlefield of the Cold War and we have to do whatever it takes to win this. There's still so much that we don't know about MKUltra and I say that because the CIA director at the time, Richard Helms, ordered all of the files to be destroyed, conveniently. Alan Dulles commanded his agents not only to spike people's drinks with LSD, but also to infiltrate seances so he could recruit clairvoyance to his mind warfare battlefield. This is how the remote viewing program began. It was funded with leftover MKUltra money. All that is to say that despite Preston's account of Montauk being, in my opinion, an absolute hodgepodge of various conspiracies all tied together with a fantastical bow, there are parts of it that are very much grounded in reality. Although I don't think the victims of MKUltra were ever sent into time tunnels, never to return again. But the technicians at Montauk didn't stop at picking up people from the street. According to Preston, they began using blonde-haired, blue-eyed children for their experiments. The reason they 
looked for blue-eyed blondes has to do with the genetic factor believed to reside in the Aryan race. This is an ancient occult doctrine that has to do with the different root races on planet Earth and is parallel to the interest of Hitler and his researchers. Preston claims that the concept of root races is an ancient occult doctrine, but it's really not. It emerged in 1888 with the release of Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine, and 1888 is hardly ancient in terms of history. In the 19th century, the word Aryan became detached from its origins as a term used by Indo-Iranians, and it began to be used by white supremacists. Blavatsky claimed that the Aryans were the fifth root race, descendants of the Atlanteans that had been the fourth. Throughout her work, she conflated race with spirituality, claiming that some races had a sacred spark missing. And if you want to know more about all of that, or Blavatsky in general, I have a whole video on her. I'm not at all surprised that she makes an appearance here. You have to remember that all four of our main characters, Preston, Duncan, Al and Peter, had been involved in New Age circles before they came together to create this wild story. In the first Montauk Project book, Preston said, Says that these children were brought to the project by one kid that was already at Montauk who acted as a kind of recruiter. But by the time the second book is published, the story changes dramatically and the children are actually being picked up by grey aliens who want to harvest fright. You know where this is going, don't you? You know, you, you already know. In more recent years, some of the so-called Montauk boys have spoken about their being harvested and that just speaks to how easy it is to keep tacking on new conspiracy theories to the story of montauk oh we are we doing are we doing adrenochrome yeah 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 no they would they've always been doing that at, um at montauk yeah adre adre we're doing it though yeah 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 absolutely Sorry, I only remembered it now. You mentioning it has jogged my memory, but yeah, they were doing it the whole time, the whole time. Preston says that some of these Montauk boys were sent to the Greys for genetic experimentation and some would be sent back to live in the general population as sleeper agents, programmed individuals, essentially. He says that some of them were also programmed to be cult leaders for the satanic movement, which is really funny to me because throughout doing so much research on cults, new age, Satanism, all of that kind of stuff. The people that I find are most likely to be cult leaders are the new age people and not the Satanists. But anyway, but he doesn't drop any names of who these like cult leaders are. He just throws it out there in the second book because a good conspiracy requires an ever expanding web and you've got to throw in Satanism somehow. You just got to get it in there. This is one bloody big project going on here. We've got time travel, weather control, teleportation, aliens, cult leaders, Satanism, everything you could want out of a story. Preston also claims that all of these young recruits were sent to the year 6037 to a dead city in ruins. In the centre of the city was a square with a gold horse on a pedestal which had a clock in its belly. The same horse that appears on the cover of the first Montauk Project book. Conveniently, Preston doesn't know what the recruiters were trying to achieve by sending these boys into 6037, but Duncan claimed that there was some technology in the pedestal and others said that the horse was there to test the powers of observation among the recruits. Either way, a dead city in 6037 feels quite ominous and there is something quite terrifying about that horse, but it's never really mentioned. Again, they just kind of brush over it. They're like, yeah, sorry, we don't know. For the Montauk boys, this must have been a terrifying and disturbing experience and Preston weaves a sinister story about their time as part of the project. He claims that they were programmed in the same way that Duncan Cameron was via psychosexual mind control techniques that tapped into their psychic ability. Once the project had used them, they would be brainwashed and programmed and sent out into the world. But some of them, like Duncan Cameron, found their way to Preston and it just so happened that he knew exactly how to deprogram them. I have the ability through my empathic or empathy to literally be able to scan and look into a human being. They involved masturbating young men and and and, and quit and then questioning them like inquisitioning them let me ask you this if you have this ability look at me and tell me what you see i can't just look at you i literally have to feel your your uh, aura and your frequencies and scan and i do it through hand scans 
has to be close on. There have never been any allegations of abuse towards Preston as far as I know, but that doesn't mean that what he did wasn't abuse. Preston later claimed that he got zero pleasure out of conducting these hands-on deprogramming techniques and even said that it was a horrible experience for him. It sounds a lot like he was manipulating people to get some sort of sexual gratification. And that's incredibly disturbing when you think about just how many people people there are that could easily get drawn in by a character like Preston. In the article it came from Outer Space by Chris Ketchum, he interviewed a former girlfriend of one of the so-called Montauk boys and she claimed each guy would go into a bedroom with Preston alone. They'd come out wild-eyed with all sorts of stories and Preston would come out covered in sweat and every week there was a new story, a new discovery. Preston carried on these psychosexual deprogramming techniques until at least the mid-2000s. He met documentary filmmaker Chris Garitano in 2006, who later went on to release the film The Montauk Chronicles. Look, the first day I met Preston Nichols, and I think Preston's a nice guy, but he was still trying to get everybody into the chair naked. You know, the guys that were with me uh, the first time I met him in 06. And I have footage of this, and it's like I'm not... You know, pointing fingers, I'm not accusing, but how does this go from I just met you 10 minutes ago to now, okay, now I'm going to put my hands on your genitals. It's like, I don't care what your reason is. It's not happening. Don't forget, Preston took this story out onto the lecturing circuit, which opened him up to a huge audience. At these new age conferences, you're going to find people that are seeking something, be it spirituality, answers to their problems, friendship or a sense of family. Preston's story offers an escape from banality. Instead of being a regular Joe Schmo, you're now a victim of a secret government mind control project. And on top of that, you're a time traveller too. You've ascended from this boring mortal coil and explored the very nature of reality itself. What could be more appealing than that for people who might have lost their way in the real world? And I think it's really no big leap to concoct this whole thing as a very warped and twisted closeted homosexual come on uh there's no doubt in my mind that that is that it really can look like that very easily he has no interest in doing it with me <laughs> i'll tell you that it's not at all unbelievable to me that these people would go to preston's lectures hear his fantastical story and then claim to be involved in the montauk project themselves according to chris ketchum there are at least 25 hardcore montauk boys in the mid and late 1990s they read the books contacted Nichols through Peter Moon and made the pilgrimage from as far off as California and New Mexico. One of these so-called Montauk boys was a man named Stuart Swerdlow. He met Preston in 1991 and at the time, Stuart was being accused of embezzlement by his employer, but he claimed to have no recollection of doing it. According to the second Montauk Project book, he pled guilty for bank fraud and was sent to the federal penitentiary in Ashland, Kentucky. But as with all things Montauk related, there was a strange story behind the embezzlement and Preston, armed with his deprogramming techniques, was going to get to the bottom of it. Through a series of deprogrammings with Preston, it was revealed that Stuart Swerdlow was hired at a major corporation as a financial officer so that he could divert funds to the Montauk project. Alongside this, a childhood filled with alien abduction by the Little Greys was revealed, a race of aliens that Stuart claims are actually overgrown human fetuses that have been mind controlled. These grey aliens, or overgrown fetuses, whatever you want to call them, were the ones that picked him up as a child and delivered him to Montauk. Now, I know what you're thinking. This all sounds a little bit unbelievable, but it is important to remember that, according to Preston, while you're being deprogrammed by him, it is absolutely impossible to lie, which makes what comes next incredibly hard to swallow. <laughs> Not 
not content with the conspiracy theories that he's already weaved into his Montauk mythos, Preston decided to incorporate a couple more for good measure. He claims that in late 1981 or early 1982, he's not really sure, the dates are a little bit rusty, the technicians at Montauk used their time travel technology to gain access to an underground area of one of the pyramids on Mars. Yes, for the purposes of this story, there are pyramids on Mars, as well as the face on Mars which was popularised in the early 90s by Richard C. Hoagland. Mars was interesting to the Montauk researchers because they had realised that there was an old technology there. They knew somebody had built the pyramids and face on Mars. These were not natural formations. Preston claims that the Montauk technicians had a special subsection of Montauk boys that were called the away team and they were sent on missions to Mars to try and access these pyramids. He says that the technicians projected into the centre of the Martian underground because it was impossible to access the pyramids any other way. They were totally sealed off. Duncan Cameron was allegedly sent to Mars in the early 80s to look for live inhabitants. Preston then claims that inhabitants were found 125,000 years in the past, but Duncan just can't access any of his memories about them. Again, very convenient. Duncan wasn't the only Montauk boy sent to Mars. Stuart Swerdlow made a trip as well, and his was a lot stranger. Now, if you think that what you've heard up until now is absolute batshit insane nonsense, then this one might just tip you over the edge. Through being deprogrammed by Preston, yes, that kind of deprogramming, Stuart remembers being transported back in time to the lifetime of Jesus Christ. And not only that, he was sent to Jesus's lifetime to steal his blood and then kill him. I was sent through the portal with the with a pistol, and my goal was to actually um, kill the Christ figure. He finally managed to find Jesus, who apparently was very personable, and offered up a vial of his blood, as you do. But Stuart's been sent on a mission to kill, and he shoots Jesus. Don't worry, though, because apparently Jesus wasn't phased at all. The bullets just flew off of him. I mean, he is Jesus, let's be real. The whole experience might have lasted for 10 hours in terms of Montauk time, but Stan felt that he'd been in the time of Christ for about two months. We believe that Stan may have somehow become Judas or walked into his body. Somehow it seemed that he assumed the identity of Judas, betrayed Christ, and arranged for his death as reported in the Bible. Again, this is all on order for Montauk. Are you following? They're now claiming that Judas was actually some lad called Stuart Swerdlow who had travelled through time under the direction of some hopped up Nazi scientists from the 1980s. And that is why Judas portrayed Jesus. Just to be clear, if you believe that these guys are telling the truth and that the Montauk project was real, that is what you believe. But hold on to your hats because we're only getting started. Stuart holds on to the blood that Jesus gave him and actually brings it back to Montauk. He has a bit of an affinity to it. I mean, it is Jesus's blood after all. It's probably the most rare collector's item in all of existence. But Jesus's blood has some magical qualities to it. And the next thing he knows, the blood is going through him like an exorcism, whatever that means. And then He's being sent through another time portal, this time to Mars, where he is told that he must hand over the blood to Jesus himself on Mars. Right, so he's on Mars, right? And he sees a bloke in robes and he's like, well, that's got to be him. Like, there ain't no, going to be nobody else here in robes knocking about on Mars. So he walks over, extends the vial of blood to him and Jesus graciously accepts. Only when Stuart locked eyes with him and like looked at him properly, he saw that it wasn't Jesus. It was actually Duncan Cameron masquerading as Christ himself. Right, you're following. We're on Mars. Stuart's got the blood giving it over to Jesus for some some unknown reason, but Jesus is actually Duncan. At this point, Stuart's had enough, and I don't bloody blame him. Like, I've had enough as well. It's too much, man. This time travel malarkey is getting really weird, really sketchy. 
So he runs off, manages to go back through the vortex portal, whatever you want to call it, and he gets back to Montauk. And when he's there, they tell him that the plan is to mix Jesus's and Duncan's blood together so that people would believe that Duncan was the second coming of Christ. I don't know why all of this had to take place on Mars, but anyway, they wanted Duncan to have the same blood and DNA profile as was found on the Shroud of Turin, which some believe was Jesus's burial cloth. Then he board a craft, fly from Mars to here, land, proclaim himself Christ, say that he's Christ returned. And according to Stuart, all this time they've actually been grooming Duncan to become the Antichrist. And the powers that be at Montauk have been trying to get one over on God. Bonkers. Preston claimed that none of this information was new. Only it was new because it was only mentioned in the second book, which was published in 1994. If this was something that was always known, then why wasn't it mentioned in the first Montauk Project book? Why wasn't it mentioned in the original Montauk Survivors video from the late 80s? Well, apparently it was the arrival of Stuart that helped to unblock Duncan's memories of being groomed to be the Antichrist which is another way to say we need to keep making things up because we've got books to sell. Anyway, apparently this whole plan backfired because before getting his hands on Jesus's blood, Duncan was a bit of an arsehole. Right? Preston describes him as conceited and arrogant. But with the power of Jesus's blood now coursing through his veins, he actually became quite a nice guy and he was starting to realise that the Montauk project had gone on long enough. After a dose of Jesus's blood, in 1983, Duncan decided that enough is enough is enough. Somebody's got to stand up to these Montauk people. They're out of control. They're organising the death of Christ. They're into, quite frankly, some mad shit and it has got to stop. So... Duncan begins to conspire with what Preston calls their little cabal, creating a plan to take down the project once and for all. On August 5th, 1983, Preston claims that they were given the order in the control room to run the transmitter non-stop. And everything was fine up until August 12th, 1983. It was then that Preston claims that all of the equipment began to sync up with something else and the USS Eldridge from 1943 appeared through the portal. Through this time portal, they could see Duncan and Al from 1943, but they stopped Duncan from being able to see himself because they wanted to prevent a time paradox. Kind of like that bit in Back to the Future where Marty's mum was trying to shag him. Although I don't think that they were worried about Duncan trying to shag himself. But I don't know, I wasn't there. The Al Bielik from 1983 was conveniently taking some time off when this was all going on, so they didn't need to really worry about him doing any shagging. Because we actually saw the vortex open and these two guys came out of it. Hmm. Give, give me, because I'm, I'm, I'm... Go ahead, go ahead. And they ended up outside on the ground on the base. Duncan and I arrived as Edward and Duncan Cameron from the Philadelphia Experiment. We were there on the base approximately 12 hours from about 2 in the morning till approximately 2 in the afternoon. A little, and we went back to the Eldridge. A plot had been conceived about some six weeks prior by Preston, by Duncan, and a number of other people, and I was not part of it which was to bring the station down because they felt there were so many things wrong and evil going on there, it was just decided it was time to end it. According to their own recollection, Al Bielik as Edward Cameron and the Duncan Cameron from 1943 arrived at Montauk at 2 a.m. on August 12, 1983, after jumping off the USS Eldridge. While they're at Montauk, they're told by Dr. von Neumann that there had been a lockup in hyperspace between the technology on board the USS Eldridge and the Montauk project and that they needed to go back to 1943 to shut down the generator on board the ship. This story sounds familiar. Uh, the thing was a bit of a shock because here we were just working with Van Neumann 43, who was a young man essentially, and here we see Van Neumann 83, an old man, who knew we were coming, knew what it was all about, 
So, gentlemen, we have a problem. They also claim to have stayed at Montauk until around 2pm on August 12th, at which time they jetted back to the USS Eldridge, which presumably was around the same time that the cabal at Montauk decided to stop the project once and for all. According to Preston, somebody gave Duncan the nod and whispered in his ear, the time is now. And Duncan proceeded to manifest a monster from his subconscious who was either nine feet tall or 30 feet tall. And if you're thinking, I bet they've got zero evidence of this beast at Montauk, then you are mistaken, my friend, because there is this photograph, which is highly reminiscent of the Patterson-Gimlin film from 1967. I'll let you decide whether or not it's a real beast or just Preston Nichols wandering around in a monkey suit. Also important to note here is that in the video that circulated before the publishing of the Montauk Project books, Preston claimed that they didn't know who unleashed the beast. What was done? was in one of these chair subjects' minds, there was a little thought implanted. And the person went in, lay down the chair, went into this thing. At that point, the person unleashed through the transmitter to form, and the transmitter precipitated this huge, big, black, hairy thing that was hungry. There was no reference of it ever being Duncan. Yet, when the book comes out, suddenly they now know for sure that it was him. Anyway, this monster is now on the base and it is smashing everything in sight. It's going absolutely wild. And the only way to get rid of it was to shut down the system at Montauk. But there was obviously the problem of this lockup in hyperspace between the USS Eldridge in 1943 and the Montauk project in 1983. This powerful vortex was spiraling out of control, just like the 1984 film. Preston only managed to get it to stop by cutting the actual equipment apart. And apparently this is what sent the beast fading back into the ether. Presumably, it was that combined with the Al and Duncan from 1943 going back and destroying the equipment on board the USS Eldridge because Al Bielik claims that that's what they did. Uh, we went back, we took out the axis and we just started cutting cables right and left till the generators shut down and the equipment was off. We smashed two banks, we smashed equipment, we cut cables, we cut everything in sight. Generators went down, the ship returned to its original point in space and time. Now this is our full circle moment and it's where things get incredibly bizarre and almost unbelievable. After destroying the generators on the USS Eldridge in 1943, Duncan decided to go back through the time portal somehow to the 1980s and I don't blame him. There are a lot of terrible things about the 80s but the music was banging. Once he got back to Montauk in 1983, his body was so discombobulated from all of the time travelling that he began to grow old in a matter of days. But they can't just let him die. He's way too important. So the Montauk technicians go back in time to find Duncan's dad and they tell him, your son's dying in 1983 and the only way to save him is to have another kid. So Duncan's dad gets to it and in 1951 a new Duncan is born. But it's not until 1963, when this new child is 12 years old, that the Montauk scientists take Duncan's mind and put it into the kid's body. When he was, re when he was put in, in 63, the memories he had before 63 are very, very sketchy. Right. You know, the memories from the original entity, whoever or whatever the original entity was. He doesn't have much today, as he'll tell you, he has right. essentially sketches, bits and pieces of it. But 63 on, then you relive the normal life or whatever, went through high school or whatever? Oh, yes. So eventually, this new version of Duncan would then find his way back to the Montauk project in the 1970s as a young adult with zero recollection that he used to be in another body from the 1940s and he's just been like swapped around. Are you following? Are you confused? Do we need to take a breath? and take in what we've just learned. And I also bet you're wondering what happened to Al Bielik 
or Edward Cameron, as he's otherwise known. Well, according to Al's recovered memories, Edward continued his career and was outspoken until he became enough of a threat, at which point he was dealt with. He claims that he was put through age regression procedures, brainwashed and put into the body of a small child that was named Al and sent to live with the Bielik family to replace their baby who had just died. Edward Cameron was now Al Bielik, a normal child with zero memory of what had happened to him and Duncan was very much the same. Both had been separated, put into the bodies of children and sent out to live normal lives until they both inevitably became involved with the Montauk project again. This really does beg us to ask the question, why go to all the bother of brainwashing, regressing adult souls to the state of children and then putting them in babies' bodies if they're just going to end up back at the Montauk project anyway? I don't have any answers for that question and neither do they. Anyway, in the 1983 timeline, everyone gets brainwashed. Duncan, Preston, Al, all of them. And they lose all all recollection of ever being involved in strange goings on at Montauk until they remember it all again just a few short years later. I mean, honestly, how crap is this brainwashing? I thought brainwashing was supposed to like last a little bit. You zap out your memories and they don't come back at least for a decade. A couple of bloody years this lasted. Piss take, absolute jokers. In May or June of 1984, Preston claims that a team of black berets were sent to the base to shoot anything that moved and another team came to move all of the remaining equipment that they deemed to be sensitive to the project. They allegedly cleared out rooms with hundreds of skeletons in, presumably of the Montauk boys that didn't make it. And they also sealed up the underground areas with cement. The base was abandoned and remains that way to this day. Preston closes the first Montauk Project book by telling us that the past and the future can be changed and that time is nothing more than a hypnotic pulse that we all subconsciously submit to. He tells us that we are nothing more than pawns on a chessboard, players in a game called time. But that leaves us with one huge question. If we suppose for a moment that all of this is real and that the 1984 Philadelphia Experiment movie was actually based on the experiences of both Al Bielik and Duncan Cameron, then how did the movie screenwriters in the early 80s find out about it? Were there bigger forces behind the Montauk project than just a ragtag bunch of Nazi scientists? And if there were... Just how far back does this whole thing go? Hold on to the last of your sanity because if you thought that shooting Jesus and swapping DNA on Mars was a stretch, you ain't seen nothing yet. Along with recovering his memories of being involved with the Montour project, Preston also uncovered an earlier life as Preston B. Wilson in the 1800s. I was born in 1820-something into a family known as the Wilsons. I was Preston Wilson. One half of what he calls the Wilson brothers. And guess who the other half was? None other than Duncan Cameron. Do you remember? Yeah. Do you remember? Preston claims that these two brothers manufactured the first electronic instruments in the UK. But there is zero historical record to back any of this up. In other words, it's pure bollocks. According to Preston... The Wilson brothers were really good mates with Alistair Crowley's dad, Edward, and Preston claims that they actually merged their business interests together. And eventually, these combined businesses became known as Thorn EMI, a British company involved in electronics, music, defence and retail. They had their fingers in many pies. Again, there's no evidence to prove this at all. So where did Preston get all of his information from? No, I know this because the historian for Thorn EMI came and asked me, do I have any idea why the name Preston B. Nichols is in the Thorn archives? But his name wouldn't have been Preston Nichols. It would have been Wilson, right? Well, apparently there was a photograph from the 1800s that showed Preston Nichols alongside Preston and Marcus Wilson, 
So he's in this photograph twice, presumably. And there was a fourth person in the photograph who is speculated to be none other than Alistair Crowley himself. Where is this photograph, you ask? Well, Peter Moon writes in the second Montauk Project book that it has to be considered legend because it hasn't shown up anywhere. I love that so much. Instead of calling it what it is, load of old shite, he spins this magical, mythical tale about it. It's not a load of old cobblers, mate. It's actually legend. There's no record of, of all of that and being connected to all of this stuff. Say again? So in other words, there is literally no evidence to prove this at all. So I guess it all has to be considered legend. It feels like a deliberately constructed story to establish a tenuous link between the Montauk project and this company Thorn EMI. But why would they want to do that? Well, the company dealt with home video releases and they just so happened to be involved with the distribution of the Philadelphia Experiment movie from 1984. The Montauk gang claimed that they actually produced the movie, which I don't think is true. It was produced by New World Pictures and Cinema Group. It's like how a lot of movies carry the A24 label and they aren't actually produced by A24, they're just distributed by A24. According to Al Bielik, the release of the Philadelphia Philadelphia experiment ended up being sabotaged by the government and that's why it ended up being pulled from cinemas. <clears throat> Three days prior to its release, me and my thorn in England got a letter from the US government saying we don't want this movie shown in the US. Got another letter from the US government, we don't want this movie shown, period. So me and my thorn couldn't ignore the second communication so they fired back and if you want it stopped, they said you're going to have to get a federal court order banning it and they said we will and they did. And this is the information which basically Preston turned up. So again, there is absolutely zero evidence that any of this is true. It's just something that's been turned up by Preston and then repeated like it's an actual fact. Peter Moon wrote in the second Montauk Project book. If none of this story is true, it would seem at least a little odd that a movie could fold totally at the box office after receiving excellent reviews and then do blockbuster sales and be quite popular on video. First of all, I'm going to need Peter to brush up on the history of almost every cult classic film that has ever been made. It's a story as old as time. It does terribly at the box office, but goes on to be super successful when it finally finds the right audience when it's released on video. Video? What am I? Bloody talking like I'm in the 80s. Video. Rocky Horror Picture Show, The Big Lebowski, Mulholland Drive. They're just a few examples of movies that did absolutely terribly barely even covered the cost of production on its cinema release but went on to become cult classics secondly excellent reviews it's got a 40 percent audience score on rotten tomatoes and while i can often overlook a bad review for a lot of movies I've actually seen this one and I've got to say the plot is incredibly convoluted, hard to follow and somewhat unbelievable. But how did the screenwriters manage to get hold of the actual story of the Philadelphia experiment? Because remember... In their world, the movie is based on them and they definitely didn't co-op the plot of a sci-fi movie for their own gain. Here's where things get bizarre. Again, Preston claims that he was childhood friends with none other than Mark Hamill. Yes, that Mark Hamill, although Preston knew him as Mark Knight. Mark's father worked for the US Navy and in turn was involved with Montauk somehow. And don't go thinking that Mr. Luke Skywalker's all innocent because he was involved as well. Now, because he's also supposedly besties with Preston, he managed to get him a job as a sound engineer on the original Star Wars films. But sadly, Preston was overlooked in the credits. And not only that, Preston claims that Mark was one of the producers of the 1984 Philadelphia Experiment movie, only he got overlooked in the credits as well. So obviously, if Mark Hamill is close to the Montauk project and knows the real story from Preston, and if he's secured himself a producing gig on the movie, then that's one way of getting the story out there. And then there's also this Crowley and EMI Thorn connection. But what if there was another way? In the second Montauk project book, Peter Moon hypothesizes that the story writer 
writers may have had their own involvement with Montauk and that they were accessing their subconscious memories when writing the script. He puts forward this idea of channeling information and this is hugely popular amongst new ages. You're not using the power of your imagination, you're tapping into something metaphysical and beyond our 3D world. And trust me, I would love that to be true because I've written short stories, screenplays, scripts for YouTube and it would be so much easier if I just tapped into the etheric plane and just channeled it all instead of, you know, having to use my own creative thought through hours of research. But in Peter's world, it's seemingly impossible for a group of people to sit down and create a fantastical story. And it's also seemingly impossible for three people to watch a movie and then create their own fantastical stories off the back of it. But what of Alistair Crowley? Could he really have been involved with what was going on at Montauk? Well, Crowley did actually visit Montauk Point in the summer of 1918, and this is backed up by his own diaries, where he claims to have gotten a curious colony of blisters there. I don't know what he was up to or where the blisters were, and I don't care to know. But that does prove, by Crowley's own admission, that he was actually in Montauk, just decades before the so-called Montauk project really got going. Alongside this, Peter and Preston became low-key obsessed with what they call synchronicities. Dr. Jung put forward a new concept that he called synchronicity. This term means a meaningful coincidence of outer and inner events that are not themselves causally connected. The emphasis lies on the word meaningful. While I find the concept of synchronicities infinitely fascinating, we also have to be aware that the human brain is designed to recognise patterns. For some, synchronicities can give their lives meaning and also provide them with a sense of solace. But for others, it can make them obsessed with trying to identify patterns and have them putting together pieces that don't actually fit. In my opinion, Peter and Preston fall firmly in the camp of the latter when they both attempt to establish a history of people connected to the surname Cameron. Remember, Duncan Cameron is the man who's allegedly being groomed to be the Antichrist, so presumably there's a long history here, right? To be specific, they're looking for connections between the Cameron brothers, the Wilson brothers, and Alistair Crowley. Peter claims to have found a connection in the book The Confessions of Alistair Crowley, where he references a close friend named LCR Duncombe Jewell, who would also call himself Ludovic Cameron. So Peter's basically gone Duncombe okay that sounds like Duncan Ludovic Cameron there we go must be a connection. I mean, it all makes sense, right? He says in the Silver Anniversary edition of the Montauk Project book that Crowley wrote Duncan Cameron, but he never did. There are references to the last name Cameron in Crowley's books, but it's a popular last name with around 26,000 people in the UK actually having it. But the fun doesn't stop there. Peter goes on to reveal that Alistair Crowley was born Edward Alexander Crowley, which is true. And obviously, that's a connection to Al Bielik's past life as Edward Cameron. Honestly, he gives tons of examples of these so-called synchronistic events where he's meeting people with variations of the names Duncan, Cameron, Edward, etc. But these are all incredibly common first and last names. And when you start looking for synchronistic events, you will find them. Your brain will start seeing patterns and sometimes you can't stop. Now, those of you that are somewhat familiar with the occult and esoteric world won't be surprised that while looking for Cameron connections, Peter stumbled upon Marjorie Cameron. Marjorie was the wife of Jack Parsons, who was, among other things, the creator of the first rocket engine to use rocket fuel and the lodge leader for a branch of Alistair Crowley's Ordo Templi Orientis. Parsons had a house where he would rent rooms to those of a bohemian disposition 
He called it the Parsonage and L. Ron Hubbard ended up living there. Hubbard had his roots in occultism and according to various sources, he read some of Crowley's work at the age of 16 and was also a Rosicrucian. When he moved into the Parsonage, he soon got involved in a series of magical rituals that Parsons called Babylon working. This is such a crude explanation, but the overall goal was to summon forward the goddess Babylon and the ritual was very sexual in nature and to cut a very long story short Parsons ended up meeting Marjorie Cameron and he believed her to be an elemental woman that he had summoned forward during the rituals and then Hubbard ended up ripping him off and the rest is history the story is so wild and infinitely entertaining that it deserves a video all of its own but for now there is a great video by Tom Explores Los Angeles about Parsons that I would highly recommend watching it actually stars a friend of mine dressed up as L. Ron Hubbard and if you listen to the nonsense bizarre podcast then they've covered it on there too and if you like my channel you're gonna bloody love that podcast if you don't listen to it already Peter actually ends ends up meeting Marjorie Cameron, who tells him that her real name isn't Cameron at all, and it's actually Wilson. And she also tells him that Elron Hubbard was a Wilson too. In the book Barefaced Messiah, it's revealed that Elron's dad was actually adopted into the Hubbard family, and his original last name was Wilson, so it's true. But according to Peter... Babylon working created a rift in space-time that was similar to the Philadelphia experiment and that a doorway to the other side had been created. After this series of rituals, UFO sightings began to appear and the CIA were formed. And apparently it all links back to Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard and not the end of the Second World War, the beginning of the Cold War and the expansion of the American Empire. I'm sorry... That's just my 3D programmed thought slipping through. There has long been controversy over whether Jack Parsons died via an accident or whether it was something more nefarious. Either way, according to these guys, he might have been at Montauk too. I mean, are you surprised? At this point, if I told you that fucking Elvis was there, would you be surprised? Preston wonders whether his boss at Montauk was none other than Jack Parsons in a witness relocation program. I mean, why not? Everybody else is there. Just throw him into the mix and see what happens. It's now a good time to mention that uh, Preston also claimed to have a reptilian working in the office next to him. And I remember, I swear on a stack of Bibles, I remember a lizard man mm. in that office. It was His Highness Draco something. I can't remember the other name. Mm. But I didn't have that much to do but with it. you accepted his presence as something well, normal for him. What else do you do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're working next to this thing. Moving swiftly on, Peter went on to talk to Marjorie Cameron about this possibility of Jack being at Montauk. And she said that she had never seen Jack's body after he died and always wondered whether he'd been taken hostage somewhere. Interestingly, Peter says that Marjorie Cameron decided to distance herself from the subject of Montauk after reading one of his draft manuscripts. And I've got to say, I don't blame her. This stuff is batshit. But Marjorie Cameron wasn't the only one talking about a potential connection to Alistair Crowley. After the first book was released, Peter claims to have met a man at a dinner party who he calls Mr X. He claimed to have been in negotiations to secure the Montauk chair. So obviously Peter is well interested in chatting to this bloke and they end up having dinner together when Mr X divulges more about his involvement in the Montauk project. Mr X mentioned Alistair Crowley and how he was supposedly manipulating time when he was alive because he wasn't trapped in this three-dimensional world that we're all in. Peter asks him a very legitimate question. Was everything at Montauk happening because of Alistair Crowley? Obviously, Mr. X didn't give a straight answer, but he did say that Crowley was a wild joker who was romping through time with zero regard for the rest of us 3D normies. If you're expecting me to wrap up this section with something that actually makes sense on a logical level, then I'm afraid that you are going to be disappointed. Peter closes this bizarre and disjointed chapter of the Montauk talk mythos by claiming that because the magical diaries of Alistair Crowley has missing entries from August 12th and August 13th 1923 that somehow that proves that Crowley was very much involved in the Montauk project. Remember 
these dates are incredibly significant in the 20-year biorhythms of the Earth, according to Preston. I'll let Peter's own words close out this final chapter in the strange story of Montauk. This entire subject has given us many ponderables, and it's extremely likely that we'll get some answers in the future. The objective here is to lay open the playing field and thereby open the door to further investigation. That inevitably leads to more truth. To put this video together, I read the first three books on the Montauk project. The first two are arguably the best. After that, things start to fall off a bit, in my opinion. All of them are left incredibly open-ended, with Peter and Preston saying that more research is needed to prove some of the theories that they put forward. It's a very convenient way to try and patch over the obviously gaping holes in the story. And they also encourage more people to come forward with information. These books have been circulated heavily amongst New Age, Conspiracy and UFO circles. They're up there with Kathy O'Brien's Transformation of America and Bill Cooper's Behold a Pale Horse. While Preston and Peter rely on their disclaimer that sometimes there can be soft facts and hard facts, a lot of people reading these books have zero distinction between the two. And if you want some evidence of that, just wait a couple of weeks after this video has been uploaded, have a look through the comment section because I guarantee somebody will be be in there calling me a shill for not believing this story. When books like this, purporting to be factual, circulate among an audience that desperately want to believe, as well as an audience that often have had their own experiences that they can't explain, combined with a warranted distrust of the US government, you're effectively guaranteed to have people like Stuart Swerdlow and other so-called Montauk boys come forward. For theories like the Montauk Project to take hold, they have to be somewhat grounded in reality. We know that the CIA experimented on people against their will. So is it a huge leap for people to believe in other top secret projects? It's easy for us to criticise those that believe this and laugh at people's supposed gullibility. It's harder and arguably more important to acknowledge that yes, some conspiracies turn out to be true. And yes, the government does lie. We can't act surprised that people don't trust agencies like the CIA when they spend decades lying only to have their lies revealed and they are the enemy of the people, I'm sorry. But with all that being said, it only takes a minuscule amount of critical thinking to blow massive holes in the Montauk Project story. And it does make you wonder, does it work in agencies like the CIA's favour to promote sensational and ridiculous stories that they can hide their nefarious deeds behind? I'll let you answer that for yourself. Some people are drawn to this story through their concern for the Montauk boys. It's the save the children rhetoric that was also really popular in the 1980s because of the satanic panic, although it hasn't really gone away. Yet these same people will sit and listen to the stories of men who by their own claims were complicit in the murders of hundreds of thousands of children. That doesn't make any sense to me. And Preston and his ilk will say, well, I had a gun pointed at me. What would you do? And I've got to say, if it was my life on the line versus the lives of hundreds of thousands of kids, I'd take the bullet, Preston. I wouldn't like doing it, but I would. I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Wouldn't be able to live with myself. And I certainly wouldn't be able to then go on to write a series of books about all the terrible things that I've done. But if Henry Kissinger can do it, then why not Preston Nichols? Now, I don't believe that any of this is real. And I think this is one of the big pitfalls of making yourself both the star, the hero and the villain of your own story. If you're going to claim that you were a technician on the Montauk project, then you're essentially admitting that you were involved in child murder. But none of that really seemed to affect Preston, who continued to go out on the lecture circuit and was welcomed with open arms. And that brings me to what I think is the main motivation behind this entire story. Making money. After the books were released, Al, Preston and Duncan ran workshops that would cost you $150 in tuition, as well as more cash for your lodgings and meals. As I mentioned, they made money through speaking engagements as well as book sales. In the early 1990s, Al co-authored a book on the Philadelphia experiment with Brad Steiger, the originator of the starseed theory. 
Yes, that starseed theory that has young people on TikTok convinced that they're actually alien-human hybrids. Up until his death, Duncan offered online services such as personal energy clearing for $275, couples therapy for $350, dreamwalking for $400 and was super popular in the convention circuit up until 2017. Peter Moon runs the newsletter The Montauk Pulse where he continues to add to the Montauk law to this day because that's the thing about Montauk. You can just keep adding to it. It's the Winchester mystery house of conspiracy theories. In recent years, Stuart Swerdlow has attempted to create what looks to me to be his own new religious movement via his Expansions website. You can currently enrol in a 10 to 18 month course where you can study hyperspace and oversoul tools and techniques, whatever the fuck that means. They've got a Zazzle store with all sorts of knickknacks. You can spend a day with him on a personal retreat for a bargain price of $4,940. Oh, and he, um, he is a doctor now as well. I have to tread extremely carefully when talking about a character like this. So I'll just say that I'm sure that the entire operation is above board and that it's definitely 100% not a cult of personality built around one man. The Montauk Project's influence in the conspiracy world is far reaching but the biggest influence of all has to be on Netflix's Stranger Things. I'm not overstating this. Without Preston, Duncan, Al and Peter, Stranger Things as we know it wouldn't exist. To begin with, the show was literally called Montauk and it was set in Long Island. In their Masterclass series, the Duffer Brothers showed their original concept for the show and it was literally a dramatised version of the Montauk Project books even going so far as to keep the protagonist's name as Duncan Cameron. Obviously, this later got changed to Eleven, but key parts of the Montauk Project's story were kept. Swap out the sensory deprivation tank that Eleven is put in for the Montauk chair, or the beast that Duncan unleashes for the Demogorgon. Dr. Von Neumann for Dr. Brenner, Long Island for Hawkins, the list goes on. And because of Stranger Things, I'm kind of glad that the Montauk Project conspiracy got created because if it hadn't we arguably wouldn't have gotten the same show so every cloud and let's wait and see whether or not they incorporate a form of time travel into season five this diary should be full of entries it's not the last entry is november 6 1983 the day Will went missing. And hopefully they bring back Eddie. My feelings on Montauk are conflicted. On the one hand, I think it's a fascinating tale that has kept people interested for over 30 years. And on the other hand, I worry about the people that actually believe in a story that is very clearly not true. I worry about how easily they can be influenced into thinking that they're Montauk project survivors and how vulnerable they are to abuse and then how easily they can be relieved of a lot of cash at the hands of the people that peddle this absolute nonsense. While it can be fun to suspend disbelief for a little while, actually believing in very clearly made up stories like the Montour Project that are so easy to disprove can have serious mental health ramifications. You're losing touch with reality and before you know it, you'll be falling down a rabbit hole without a parachute, susceptible to all kinds of new age grifters and conspiracy capitalists who'll meet you on the way down, all of them desperate to sell you their version of the truth. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. And thanks again to our sponsor, glassesusa.com. You can follow the link in my bio and grab yourself a gorgeous pair of glasses. And I will see you in the next video unless I'm taken out by the Montauk Project technicians for knowing too much. But fingers crossed, fingers crossed we're going to be fine. Bye! Fire, fire.